Ireland sits across the Irish Sea from England. And Dublin, the capital, is perched on the East Coast. One of the joys of Ireland is Irish Standard Time. It's slower than our version, with plenty of time for good conversation. The Irish love to talk. Some of them were vaccinated with phonograph needles. There are daily flights to Dublin from JFK in New York. The airport is about 10 miles north of the city center. Dublin isn't pretty or spectacular, but it's very friendly and very vibrant. Lots of street life, students, and oh yeah, pubs. I headed to the tourist office on Suffolk Street to see if they could help me find somewhere to stay in Dublin. Listen, this is a really impressive tourist office. I think it's the biggest I've seen in Europe. Um, if I need a hotel room or a b and room in Dublin, what can you folks do for me? Well, we can make a booking for you. Uh, it's up to you really to decide, and we can help you with it, a hotel, guest house, bed and breakfast. Now, after I do Dublin, I'm going to be going down to Waterford and Wexford. Sure. Can you help me find a room down there? Sure, we make bookings um, all over Ireland, um, although we're Dublin tourism. Right. And we charge two pounds if we make a booking outside of Dublin. Right. The same applies, we take 10% here. In so in it's Dublin. one of those one-stop shopping absolutely. deals. Absolutely, we right. even do an itinerary for you. We'll plan it. Really? Absolutely, yeah. You'll tell us if it makes sense for me to go here or if I'll need a car or whatever, sure. that kind of thing. Sure, yeah. You can also change your money into Irish pounds, or punts as they're called over here. I stayed at the Charleville Lodge where I sampled a traditional Irish breakfast, the breakfast of leprechauns. I haven't even had coffee yet, so I'm not gonna say top of the morning to you. Besides, that's such a cliche about Ireland. But I'm gonna have here a traditional Irish breakfast, black pudding, and white pudding. It's pig's blood stuffed in a sausage with oats. Mm. It almost tastes like I'm chewing on a piece of um, something that's been like charcoal or something. It doesn't taste bad, but it actually has a very, very delicate flavor. It's not, it's not really what I was expecting. It's sort of like, I don't know, like a wispy taste. It's not bad. Before I have a little more blood pudding, let me tell you that there's a wide variety of accommodation B&Bs in Ireland. Something from a very modest private house to this place, which is really like a small hotel. Very nice, too. At the Charleville Lodge, B&B starts from 28 punts per person. That's about $44. Now all I have to do is burn off that blood pudding. In Dublin's fair city, where girls are so pretty, they built this here statue to Molly Malone. The Irish call this the tart with the cart. Ah, that Irish wit. First stop on my sightseeing tour is Trinity College, which is actually Dublin's university. It's just round the corner from the main shopping street. Oliver Goldsmith, Jonathan Swift, Samuel Beckett, and Oscar Wilde all played hooky here. There must be something in the water that breeds genius. You can visit Trinity College at your own pace or on a tour. It's free to get in and open every day. The old library here holds 200,000 of Ireland's oldest books, including the world-famous Book of Kells. The old library is open daily, and admission costs three punts fifty. Grafton Street is Dublin's Fifth Avenue. Not many bargains, but plenty of shoppers, tourists, and street musicians. And the best cup of Java in town. And here we come to Bewley's Oriental Cafes. It's a bit of a Dublin landmark. It's a lively place to have a cup of coffee. It has a fun atmosphere, a bit like a faded 1950s cafeteria. Worth a visit. Most tourists stick to Grafton Street, but the locals hang out in Dublin's Greenwich Village, the Temple Bar area. Bad food, bars, and t-shirts, just like the village. One of the best restaurants in the Temple Bar area, though, is at the Hotel Clarence. So I followed my nose and found it without much problem. Before it was renovated, the Clarence was where visiting nuns and priests would stay in Dublin. And the new owners have kept the ecclesiastical style. This foyer looks like a confessional box. And wait till you see the bedrooms. Thanks a lot. 
So here at the Clarence, as at better hotels around Ireland, you will have to show your passport. And here, like at hotels everywhere, they want to see a credit card. How's this? Purples? Goals? Gee, it reminds me of my altar boy days. This hotel is popular with members of the media, fashion, and showbiz crowd. Jack Nicholson and Tina Turner, for two names I could drop. And it's owned by members of the rock band U2. With my luck, they'll be rehearsing upstairs. At the Clarence, rooms cost from 130 punts. And you do have to pay extra for breakfast. For the grand finale, I headed for the restaurant and spoke to the top chef, Michael. No Irish stew in here. Okay. Chef Michael is about to explain to me what I have on my plate here. It looks like a, I don't know, it's either a ski lift or a rocket launcher. Michael, what is this thing here? John, that's some local crab that we got from a Dublin port from uh, Hoth with a parmesan twill mm -hmm. um, and some tomatoes straight from Italy. So it's a bit of a cosmopolitan dish that suits the style of this hotel. Yeah. Now, I'm dressed very casually. Could I come to dinner here dressed this way? Of course you can, yeah. yeah. Again, that's the policy and the philosophy through the hotel. It would be, because of who we deal with and the type of clientele we approach, it would be very sort of cosmopolitan to come in in jeans, t-shirts, or in a suit and a tie. Mm -hmm. And the room leads, leads itself and lends itself to that as well, John, mm -hmm. you know, because of its big ceiling and light and bright. And now, I asked for a red wine because I do generally prefer red wine. I'm right. having crab. Is this allowed? Do I lose points because I'm no. having red wine? You can have what you red? want. Really? Yeah. Yeah. We're user friendly, yeah. This is very delicious and as you can see it was beautifully presented and i'm just gonna have a little bit more michael bravo thank you Jeff. a three-course meal at the clarence costs from 18 punts per person that's about 29 dollars michael's lips were sealed when it came to his cooking secrets but he did tell me where i could get traditional irish clothing at the kilkenny shop near trinity college you can find tweeds woolens linens and crystal from all over ireland Good quality and at a good price, right in the center of Dublin. And tax-free shopping, too. Bernadette, excuse me, this is probably a very silly question, but what's the difference between a hand-knitted sweater and a hand-loomed sweater? The difference between the hand-loom is that it's made on a, a flat machine, like this, straight across. You've seen people right. walking on machines, and it's one across. Uh -huh. This is hand by two needles in people's homes. This is made in the factory. I see. This is made in people's homes right. around Ireland. Right. And it was actually done by this person. This is like a sign. This is, this is the person who knitted. We right. have like 500 knitters around Ireland, right. and they sign their own sweaters. So Bridie O'Brien made that one and Mrs. Kelly made this, one. made this one. And are these like secret designs? Does this mean something, these well, different in, patterns? In the what? old days, they did say that the patterns on the sweaters, eh, the fishermen out in, in the sea, that if there was any boating accident, that they would know by the person. They'd know by the pattern on their sweater who, who, who had an accident. So before they, they hooked would, them out of the water, the floater, they would that, know That's right. That's, that's, that's a very old story, that they would wow. know the pattern of the sweater. I'll have to, maybe I should wear this next time I'm on a boat then, huh? It is beautiful. How does that one feel? It feels great. Aaron hand-knit sweaters at the Kilkenny Center cost from 68 punts. Stay with me, and we'll go on a pub crawl in Dublin, and I'll take you to the magical Wicklow Mountains, all coming up in A Practical Guide to Europe from Around Dublin. Everywhere you go in Dublin, you run into sidewalk symphonies. If you want more than an I Love Dublin ashtray for a keepsake, then follow my cab to the Liberties. You know, I'm finding it really is true what they say about the Irish. They've all got the gift of the gab. I just had a great taxi driver. This is the Liberties part of Dublin, and it's famous for antique shops. I understand you can get a good deal here, but I've been warned that there are a lot of light-fingered pickpockets around, so watch yourself. Let's see what the prices are like in here. I'm no antiques expert, but these prices look darn good to me, even with the shipping price whacked on top.
I love these old phonographs. Huh? Beautiful. Now, don't worry. You don't have to try and smuggle your antiques on the plane with you. You'd never fit these things in the overhead anyway. The antique stores here in Dublin will ship stuff back to the States for you. And they do such a big business, the prices are very reasonable. Lock drunk, is that an Irish? Name? Note how yeah, I dazzle this like pretty Colleen like with my Irish. manly knowledge of all <laughs> like things like antique. This. Yeah. So this is this is a penny farthing or, or no? No, this one is called um, a bone shaker. Bone shaker, right. Which if you sat up in it, you'd know why. Yeah. Boy, no, no shock absorbers, huh? No, afraid not. And yeah. uh, this is the braking mechanism here. Let me see how that works then. It's like so that stops, the huh? way we have our handlebars now, and it's actually controlled, the direction is controlled with your foot. Right. Is this, did this come before the ones that had like the really big wheel in the front and the small wheel in the back? I would say this is later. Later. Later so than the penny farthing. Around what year? Probably about 1900. Ah, right. So that's very late Victorian, huh? Yeah. Beautiful. Sort of tending into Edwardian. But this one has been fully restored. Uh-huh. Which is why it's um, in rideable condition. Yeah. <laughs> It looks real industrial revolution with all the metal. Have you ridden it? Have you tried it? Certainly not. No? <laughs> Before leaving Dublin, I had to taste Guinness, the Irish elixir. And where better than on a literary pub crawl, which starts at the Duke pub on Duke Street. Charming spot. Inspiring prospects. Let's go. We can't. Why not? We're waiting for God. Oh. Are you sure it was here? What? And we were to wait. He said by the tree. Do you see it? It's off each morning to the pub. And she goes in for another little drop. And the heart of the roll is dicey riley. She won't. The crawl mixes history, booze, literature, booze, humor, and booze. I think I sense a theme here. Uh, Mr. Bean, Mr. Bean over here. Uh, thank you. Can I ask you a few questions? Uh, first of all, Mr. Bean, uh, what do you think of Canada? It'll be nice when it's finished. <laughs> he was given a one-month jail sentence for the fist fight, and at this point, the IRA, fed up with his antics, court-martialed him for bringing the movement into disrepute. <laughs> they sent him a letter. They sent him a letter in prison to say that he had been court-martialed in his absence, found guilty, and was sentenced to death. Could he please show up at his earliest convenience? <laughs> he wrote back and says, "Well, since you tried me in me absence, you can bloody well shoot me in me absence." The Jamesons. <laughs> literary pub crawl begins daily at 7.30 p.m., and it costs six punts. The Wicklow Mountains are called the Garden of Dublin, and exploring them, you feel like you're a million miles from the city. They lie directly south of Dublin, and the journey by car takes about half an hour. But don't expect to find super highways over here. There are narrow roads, lots of sheep, and you'll need lots of patience to get where you're going. Car rental for one week costs 170 punts. But check fly drive deals. Enniskerry is just a 30 minute drive south of Dublin and a perfect break from town. It's a pretty village, and the big draw here is the landscape gardens at Powers Court. Mid-Victorian, Italian, and Japanese chiseled hedges. Gee, is that real or a painted backdrop? The gardens are open daily, and entrance costs three punts. An hour's drive further south of Enniskerry will take you to Glendalough. Not easy to find, but worth it. This is the Glen of Two Lakes, one of the most important early Christian sites in Ireland, with the remains of a monastery founded by St. Kevin. Glendalough is open daily, and entrance is free. The county of Waterford runs down to the south coast of Ireland, and Waterford City is about a two and a half hour drive from Dublin. This is Kennedy country. It's got hills and a beautiful coastline. I just wish I could say the same about the weather. The folks on that beach back there are using a sunblock minus five. Yeah, not a lot of sunshine here in Ireland. You get wet, rainy, and then wet again. So when the sun does shine, you be sure and make hay, because it won't last long. I stayed just outside Waterford City at Foxmount Farm, an old farmhouse and the perfect place to sample real Irish hospitality. You know that dream of a vacation we all have in mind? The one where you stay on a beautiful, romantic farm and you get a warm, genuine greeting from the locals? Well, I think I found it.
I tracked down the owner, Mrs. Kent, carefully sidestepping cow muffins as I went. Mrs. Kent, if these cows attack, do I do I put my head down and graze? What? How do I protect myself? <laughs> you get back into the car quickly. <laughs> quickly, huh? Okay, and here they come. They don't attack. Here I go. <laughs> <laughs> Irish no, attack they're, cows. They're very friendly. They're yeah. very friendly. <laughs> is this your back forty? Is this a piece of bottom land uh, back here? Whatever that is. No, no, no. This is this is part of our farm. We have right. a two hundred acre dairy farm. Uh huh. And uh, this is part of it. And how old is the farmhouse itself? The farmhouse is seventeenth century. Ah, so we're Georgian? Living. Georgian, yes, Georgian. Right. Now, you, I mean, it's a very romantic house here. It's a beautiful farm. Uh, yes. You're part of an association, huh? Yes. Um, about 30 years ago, we set up the association, the Irish Farm Holiday Association, and I was one of the founder members, actually, of the association. I still am a member. So if someone goes to an Irish mm. national tourist port or they mm. contact them and they say, I want to stay on a farm holiday mm. in mm. Ireland, mm -hmm. they would they would be able to get information about this place, is that Oh, it? yes, they will. They will possibly be given, be given uh, the farmhouse holiday guide to Ireland, and they also might be given the, f the friendly homes guide, right. which is a lovely guide, too. You can stay for as little as one night or spend your whole vacation here. One night's B&B &B at Foxmount Farm costs 23 pence per person. Stay with me and we'll see glass blowers in action and we'll drown some worms just off the south rain. Believe me, you're gonna run into it. And when you do, run into Waterford Crystal. If it's crystal you want, it's crystal you'll get. And at better than store prices. Waterford prides itself on quality, so there's no second shop here. This is what happens to anything with even the slightest imperfections. Kids, don't try this at home. Still raining? All aboard the factory tour. Don't visit at lunchtime, though. These guys gotta eat too, you know. Every American man's dream to hold a Super Bowl trophy. They make it right here in Waterford. And because they don't know who's gonna win the darn thing, they have to make two stoppers to go on top here. The losing stopper must be a real collector's item. Heavy. Tough to punt this baby. The factory tour costs three punts 50. Dunmore East is a 15-minute drive from Waterford City, and it's one of the prettiest villages in the whole county. Avast, ahoy, shiver me timbers. I hope I don't get sick. I met my skipper, John, and we prepared to sail. Yeah, I should have bought that Aaron sweater to impress my mates. Now, John, what else do you take folk out for besides well, mackerel? Uh, I do shark fishing, wreck uh -huh. fishing. Reef. This is we're on a reef here now. Yeah. There's uh, some very nice cod around this reef and pollock, you know. Yeah. And you can fix folk up with a rod and reel. Oh, absolutely. Maybe they don't have to bring yeah. it over yeah. with themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Have all the gear for hire on board. Yeah. Yeah. And where do we find out about you? The tourist board. The tourist or? board. Uh, my brochures are in all the hotels, right. campsites, um, yeah. holiday homes. Uh huh. Yeah. Catch him upside down. I caught him by the tail. <laughs> oh, sorry. Man, I got three mackerel here. Great. Look at that jumping into the boat here. In two minutes here, I've caught more fish than I've caught in my entire life. You see? You went to the bathroom, and look what I caught while you were gone. One day fishing in Dunmore East will cost 20 punts per person. That's about $32. Ireland is a really charming and relaxing place for a vacation, and you'll enjoy your time here even more if you remember these practical tips. Book all your accommodation at Dublin Tourist Office. 
Don't forget to claim your tax back at the airport on purchases made in Ireland. Think about shipping antiques home. It's cheaper than you think. Rent a car to see the countryside. Careful on the narrow roads and watch for the sheep. Check out staying in farmhouse accommodation to meet the locals and save money. And buy your crystal directly from Waterford Crystal Showroom. It's less expensive than in the shops. This is John Garasio saying goodbye from Waterford, Ireland. Scotland sits on top of England. It's about half England's size, but with only a tenth of the population. A geological fault splits Scotland in two. As a result, the country is divided into what we know as the highlands and the lowlands. Scotland has one of the most beautiful capital cities in all of Europe, Edinburgh, and some scenery that rivals the American West, especially up north. It also has one of the best art festivals in the world and a vital, vibrant culture. Okay, now the bad news, the weather. Can't have everything. Edinburgh is Scotland's capital city. It lies on the east coast of the lowlands and is one of the country's main transportation hubs. There aren't many direct flights to Scotland from the U.S., so you'll probably have to get a connecting flight in London for Edinburgh Airport. There are some pretty good deals on flights from London to Edinburgh, so why take the train when you can fly for about the same price? Edinburgh is one of the most dramatic cities in Europe. Small enough to sample in a weekend, but big enough to keep you exploring for months. There are two castles here to visit, Edinburgh Castle and Holyrood Palace. There are art galleries galore and enough shopping to keep you out of the museums and in the shops all day. I stayed in the center of town at 17 Abercrombie Place to be an easy reach of the sights. When I got there, I was welcomed by Arliss Lloyd, the owner. Hi, how are you? You're on. Now, Ireless, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, eating porridge, oatmeal. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was a traditional Scottish breakfast. It's very good for you, very good for the heart. Yeah. And this is what traditionally we have. Huh. Are you kidding me, or I'm supposed to put salt on my porridge? Salt and porridge. You ready for this? I grew up with uh, sugar and milk, but salt, no. huh? No. Okay. You don't like fillings in the teeth. Real sticks to your ribs Scottish oats, mm -hmm. huh? Lovely. <laughs> and you can't put jam in it either. <laughs> Hot and hearty. Yes. Yeah, and you know, it's not bad with salt. I'm so if I, I come to a b and I'm going to get a bed and breakfast, right? Yes. Now, what else do I, am, can I stay in my room during the day and read if I'd like to, or do you kick me out at 9 o'clock in the morning? Because <laughs> no. I've heard about your B&B <laughs> Yes, absolutely, very strict. No, what we do is when people arrive, we show them in. There's a sitting room that they can use if they wish, um, and we give them a key. What I do is I treat people as guests in my home. Uh huh. Yeah, that's one of the things I always like about staying in B and Bs in Europe or in Agro Turismos, for instance, in Italy. You get to stay with a native of the area, and they can always give you practical tips on how to enjoy your time there. And by the way, I'm in Scotland. I'm having tea. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Man. Staying with Arliss, you feel more like a family guest. It's an elegant townhouse, but homey. You know, the standard in accommodation in European hotels and B&Bs tends to be very erratic. So be sure to ask a lot of questions before you make a reservation, and try to see the room if you can first. I think this place is a real find. Nice rooms. Now, it's not inexpensive, but by British standards, it's a real bargain. B&B &B at 17 Abercrombie Place costs 80 pounds for a double room. You can get around Edinburgh easily by public bus, tour bus, or on foot. Lots of hills, though, so wear walking shoes. But I certainly didn't feel like walking after that porridge, so I took a taxi to the old town to see Edinburgh's most famous site. They have these great black cabs here in Scotland like they do down in England. They're the best in the world. 
not the cheapest, but the best. And the really good thing about them is, like down in London, the taxi drivers really know the city. Now, you'll pay what's on the meter there. You can call them or you can hail them in the street. You can get a receipt if you need that. They'll take you to the airport, whatever. The way to go. First stop on the sightseeing tour is Edinburgh Castle. Come on, let's storm it. It was built on top of an extinct volcano in the 11th century. This is where Mary, Queen of Scots, gave birth to the first king of both England and Scotland, James I of England and VI of Scotland. Edinburgh Castle is open daily, and admission is £5.50. Edinburgh Castle is in the heart of the Old Town, and the street that runs down from it is called the Royal Mile, because exactly one mile down the road stands another royal residence, Holyrood Palace. This is where the Queen of England and all the royal family stay when they're in town. When they're not in town, the palace is open to the general public. Holyrood Palace is open daily, and admission is five pounds. This is the ye olde part of town. Great for atmosphere, but for shopping and eating, I'd head for the new part of town. It's less touristy and you'll get a better deal. Princess Street runs parallel to the Royal Mile. You step right into it if you come by train. And if you've got your bearings by now, you'll know this burg like a native. More and more payphones around Britain, and that means Scotland too, are using these phone cards. Some of them still take coins, and a lot of them you can even use your credit card to phone home. Now, you pick up these phone cards in the same place where you buy your morning newspaper. Princess Street is also where you'll find the tourist information center for Edinburgh and the whole of Scotland. I've just been inside the Edinburgh Tourist Information Office. They'll sell you a t-shirt or a postcard in there, and they can help you find a room either in Edinburgh or outside of town. They also have information on events, and there's a money-changing bureau there. But listen, they charge very high commission, and you'll do much better if you use your own bank card in a cash machine in the wall. Edinburgh has more than its fair share of art galleries. The National Gallery is just off Princess Street. This is The Three Graces by Antonio Canova. And Edinburgh has three, count them, three major art galleries. This is the National Gallery. There's also the National Portrait Gallery and the National Gallery of Modern Art. And the best news is they're all scot-free. Van Gogh, Gauguin, it's great for international art and for an interesting view of Edinburgh itself. Now, here in the Scottish wing, we can use this very romantic view of Edinburgh as the Athens of the North to get our bearings. If you come up from London by train, you'll be arriving at the train station here. Well, it'll be there eventually. Now, this is Princess Street. A lot of good shopping along here. Oh, tourist information office? Right about there. Holyrood Castle, over that away. And somewhere in here, I think there's a McDonald's. But this is 1825, so there's been only one served. The National Gallery is open daily, and admission is free. Porridge for breakfast. Huh? If I'm gonna eat like a Scot, I'd better dress like one. So I'm off to Stuart Christie and Company, where I'm going native. Now all I need is a rifle or a fishing rod, and I'm the real country gent. Tweed jackets at Stuart Christie & Co. cost from 160 pounds. Don't go away, because I'll be showing you where you can stay in a 13th century castle, and where the first game of golf was played. All coming up in A Practical Guide to Europe from Around Edinburgh.
Edinburgh is at its best and busiest during the New Year Festival called Hogmanay and the Arts Festival in August. If you want to come at these times, just be aware these festivals really draw the crowds. Now, it's not like this all the time in Edinburgh. This is the festival when it gets this carnival feel. You can soak up the festival atmosphere for free by wandering through the streets. But to see a particular show, you must buy tickets from the festival shop on the Royal Mile. Advance reservations are recommended. Or you might get lucky like me and get a personal invitation to a show. Yeah, you see, the fun thing about the festival is you run into people all the time who are trying to get you to come to see their show. These folks are doing Tartuffe by Moliere. I think it'd be a fun show. During festival time, you should reserve your room in advance, too, and consider staying just out of town. Dalhousie Castle dates back to the 13th century. It's only eight miles south of the city center, though it feels like it's a hundred miles away. It belongs to the Grand Heritage Hotels of the World, and its visitors have included Queen Victoria, Robert the Bruce, and John de Garacio. You can dine in the dungeon and sleep in one of the 25 exquisite bedrooms. At Dalhousie Castle, double rooms start at 100 pounds per person. And that includes full Scottish breakfast. Out here, you can enjoy the tranquility of the countryside and head back to town for the nightlife. One of the most popular attractions at festival time is the Edinburgh Tattoo. The tattoo was the call to soldiers to come back from the pub, but today it's an international military hoedown and battle of the bands. Again, be sure to reserve your tickets in advance. go on sale in January, and you can buy them directly from the tattoo shop in Edinburgh or from Edwards & Edwards in New York. Tickets for the tattoo start at eight pounds. St. Andrews is just up the coast from Edinburgh. You can get there by public transportation, but to really see the Scottish countryside, you need to rent a car. The journey will take you about one and a half hours by car. St. Andrews is an ancient town with the oldest university in Scotland. It's a pretty little place with ruins of a castle and a cathedral to visit. But the major pull for coming here is golf. Golfers have been lying about their scores here since 1547 and a round of golf at the home of golf is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Now, there are more than 35 golf courses in and around St. Andrews, but the most famous is the old course at the Lynx. If you want to play on the old course, you have to take part in a lottery, which you can find out about at the Lynx Clubhouse. Golf club rental at the Lynx costs 20 pounds a day. St. Andrews is worth a visit, but if you're not heavily into golf, you'll do it in a day. Perthshire is in the heart of Scotland. It's the gateway to the Highlands. I stayed near the town of Aberfeldy. I communed with nature and contemplated buying a kilt. I reserve these rooms for Tom Vale B&B at the Edinburgh Tourist Office before heading up north. I'm talking with Hazel and Amy here. Hazel, uh, what's this book a bed ahead scheme? 
Uh, well, it's run through the tourist board and you can go into any tourist board in the country and book for accommodation uh, either the night, the following evening or further on than that, right. probably up to a couple of weeks ahead. So it's the type of thing I wouldn't do before I leave America, but maybe if I was in Edinburgh and had done the city and wanted to get out to a farm, I might be able to, to do that. Yes. And if I stay here, do I get to milk the sheep and all that stuff? No, I'm afraid. See, I'm a city kid. Is that what you do? You milk a sheep? I don't <laughs> no, know about this. No, I'm afraid not. Um, you can actually not actually take part in the farm work because right. of safety ah, aspects. Ah, insurance and but all that, But you can so. certainly have a look round. Uh, my husband um, is here and can show you things. Right. Or, or the children can take you round. Yeah. I mean, they quite like showing off, showing right. everything. Amy, can you say, book a better head five times fast? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I can't either. Right. <laughs> At Tom Vale B and B, expect to pay from fourteen pounds per person per night. That's around twenty-three dollars. Just a few miles down the road from Aberfeldy is the village of Kenmore, which sits on the edge of Loch Tay. The inn here is believed to be the oldest in Scotland. It's a great base for outdoor activities. Crofton Akeber Activity Centre offers general outdoor sports activities around Loch Tay. Everything from windsurfing to kayaking. No, I'm not about to be shot out of a cannon. I'm going to be taught kayaking on Loch Tay, home of the dreaded Loch Tay monster. Hence, this helmet. Okay, so I look like I need training wheels on my kayak. But the lock is a good training ground. You learn your basic skills there before moving out onto the waters of the River Tay. <laughs> At Croft and the Caper, kayaking for half a day costs 26 pounds. Stay with me, and I'll take you to the oldest distillery in Scotland, and we'll go fishing on the banks of the River Tay. All coming up in A Practical Guide to Europe from around Edinburgh, Scotland. Scotland, land of scotch plaid, butterscotch, hopscotch, and scotch. For research purposes only, I went to the Glen Turret Distillery, the oldest in the country. You'll find it in Creef, which is about an hour's drive from Aberfeldy and about two hours from Edinburgh. Welcome to Glen Turret Distillery, Scotland's oldest working distillery here, and we date back to about 1775. Okay, the water, it's heated in the tank here to about 70 degrees centigrade. That's from outside the safe. We can look to see the colour is right. The temperature, that's 95 degrees centigrade. I think the main reason the would be tour that isn't it's scintillating, sort of enough but it's painless and brief. And there's few knots in the actual wood. Creef Distillery tours run every day and cost two pounds ninety. You're rewarded with the tasting session. Now I'm going to try first of all the liqueur. And this is a 15-year-old. Very light, huh? You know, I've never tasted a whiskey like that. It's very delicate. This is the 18-year-old. Interesting. Hmm. You know, I think my favorite is the regular strength 15-year-old. Now, I mentioned that this is a good deal, and that brings up the subject of money. Scottish money is basically like English money. I mean, it's the same value anyway, and you can use English money up here north of the border. Here are some Scottish notes, though. There's a five-pound Scottish note. 10 pound. Now here's a 20 pound English note. Remember I said that they'll take English money up here. And here's an English coin, one pound coin. And while you're studying the money, I think I'll have a little more of this 15 year old. 
After golf and scotch whiskey, I had to try my hand at Scotland's other favorite pastime, fishing. And if you want to get that big catch, you can hire a guide for the day. They call them gillies. Okay, Bob, you promised me a giant salmon today. I'll keep fishing, Joe. <laughs> Bob told me that fishing for salmon on Sunday is forbidden. It's their day off, I guess. Maybe that explains my empty hook. All right, it's a strange-looking salmon. It's silvery and blue, and it's got these strange barbs on one end, but hey, good eating, I bet. You can rent a ghillie like Bob at 50 pounds per day. Fantastic fishing, world-class whiskey, beautiful stone villages, and one of the most cultured cities in the world, all within an hour and a half's drive of each other. This part of Scotland is a great place for a vacation, and you'll enjoy your time here even more if you remember these practical tips. The festival is a good time to come to Scotland, but remember to reserve your room early. Rent golf clubs in St. Andrews for the day, and not for the hour. Check out the Book a Bed Ahead service at the tourist office in Edinburgh. Make sure you have a permit to fish in Scottish rivers, and remember, no salmon on Sundays. This is John Garasio saying goodbye from the River Tay in Scotland.